To behold you as my King. To behold you as oh, my King. Oh, for your glory. For your glory. I will do anything. I will do it. To see the Lord in your glory, Just to see God. Shall we rise up in the presence of the Lord? Shall we rise up? To Under your wings, under the shadow of your wings, under the protection, under the care, under your eyes. We can see it that even a thousand fall at my side and ten thousand by my right. Yet there'll be no harm that befalls. In that place, in that secret place, where we find your presence, where we behold your glory. Your glory. Make that your prayer this morning. Make that your prayer this morning. Be where you are. Wanna be where you are. Wanna be where you are. Wanna be where you are. Gotta be where you are. Gotta be where you are. Say for your glory, for your glory. I will do anything, Father, to behold you. I will do anything to behold you. Just to see. Keep your eyes closed and open your mouth out and speak to the Lord, speak to the Lord, speak to the Lord, just speak to the Lord. You're in the presence, you're in the presence of the Holy One. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Malachi chapter 3, it says, I am the Lord and I change not. I am the Lord and I change not. He is the same that yesterday, he's the same today and he's the same forever. I am the Lord and I change not, says the Lord. You worship an unchanging God. You worship a faithful God. Can you lift your voice up in the presence of the Lord and just worship Him right now? In your own words. Speak to Him in your own words. Just talk to Him. Let Him hear you. Let Him hear you. He's an unchanging God. An unchanging God. Hallelujah. 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 For your glory. Just to see you, to behold you as my King, for your glory, I will do anything, just to see you, just to see you, to behold Father, we give you the glory and the honor. We give you all the power and the praise. It all belongs to you. And God's people said, Amen, Amen. Amen. Shall we give God the glory this morning? <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Like I said, we worship and we praise an unchanging God. He is Jehovah. He's the one that does not change at all. 
So can we all get together to worship him this morning? Hallelujah. <laughs> there's no God like Jehovah. There's no king like him. Shall we sing there's no God? Hallelujah. Let's go, let
found out that he had cerebral malaria and they found out four days later. As a doctor, some of you would know that if you find out after four days, the chances of death is very high. And so things started getting really, really bad for him. And, you know, in a few days, I want to keep it really short, but in a few days, you know, water filled his lungs, water filled his heart, his kidneys started failing, his blood pressure, some of you would know, it went down to, I think, 30. And, and I think most of you know that 30 is fatal. I mean, you will die if it is 30. They had to just tie him on the bed and turn him upside down and, and cut right on his throat and put medicine in because they didn't even have time to put anesthesia. They didn't have time. It was that bad. And then once it affects the brain, things go bad. And you know, uh, the doctor said, we don't have much that we can do anymore. And then there came a time where he said, you can call your family. They can come and meet him now because that's all that we can do. It's the end of it. <coughs> But the number of people that prayed for my brother at that time, it is unbelievable. There are people that I never knew. I never knew. 
people that I knew just once in my life that people have, I mean people from different countries so many of them just called me and said we are praying we are praying so one person from one church would call and then they would tell someone from another church and they would tell some other youth group and there were so many people that prayed we were just blessed and so my father he was there at that time in dubai so he called me and said look just come i mean before you come i don't know what's going to happen so you just come now and so we just packed up and it was eid we didn't get visa all of these issues but we prayed and we landed there and he's because it was celebrated malaria he started getting delusional so he was speaking things he was getting violent because it started affecting his brain and normally when you come out of that even if you come out you know you can have permanent damage but we landed in dubai when we landed in dubai we went straight to the hospital i saw my brother sitting up and so he i mean the lord gave my brother back to me my younger brother and that is something that i will never forget because it was I mean, we had many situations but that has been one of the biggest turning points in our life and so when i sing this song i sing it with meaning i sing it lord i want to thank you for you turn my life around and i'm sure that's just not my story i'm sure there are many people standing right here where your jobs were turned around your businesses were turned around your relationships with your families were turned around I don't know your finances could have been turned around and there could be some people here who are standing who need a turn around right now but if you believe in you know that's why the bible says you send your praises you, your worshipers ahead of the army the bible says you send your worshipers ahead of the army you want to bring down the wall you just send them in praise that's all can you just close your eyes for a moment and say lord I believe in these songs. I believe what I'm saying because out of the words of your mouth there is power. Jehovah turn my life around. Jehovah turn my life around. He makes a way where there is no way. Jehovah as the final say a makes a way where there is no way jehovah has the fine believe in that he makes a way where there is no way jehovah has the final say jehovah turn my life around jehovah turn my life in the desert rivers in the desert is the promise of the lord as the finals he makes a way where there is no way jehovah turn jehovah turn my life yes lord therefore i sing that when troubles come my way i will lift up my voice and i will praise you If I have a need I will not focus on my need I will focus on the provider If I have a need for healing I won't focus on the sickness I will focus on the healer And that's I focus Lord I just keep my eyes on you I keep my eyes on you Father I keep my eyes on you Lord and you alone is who I worship Father Yeah I'll worship you alone you alone you alone Make that your prayer. Make that your commitment this morning. You alone I worship. Hey, we give you all the
no place at the sound of your greatness and leave us to flee at the sound of your
There is no other name. There is no one else. But you alone, you alone, you alone, you alone, you alone. You alone, you alone. your focus. 
focus, just keep it on his faith. Just keep it on his faith. Let that grace shine upon you. and some put their trust in chariots but I will keep my faith upon you. Let that be your promise. I will not keep my trust on any man. I will keep my faith upon you alone. I will wait upon you alone, Jesus. I will wait upon you. And let your grace and your grace alone just seep through my soul and my spirit. you, Lord. The Bible says in Jeremiah that it is not for man to decide his steps. If just he would have the humility to just allow the Lord to lead him. And let that humility come into your heart as you sing that, Lord, I come. I confess. With complete humility. Lord, I am not a self-made man. Let every day be ordained by you. Without you, without you, I crumble, I fall, I part away. You are the world. secret place right now. Nobody is watching. Just open your heart. Today it is. Lord, I need you. I need you, Lord. Yes.
the secret place. You're in the secret place of the Lord. And do those wings just say the word. No condemnation, no condemnation. Where sin runs deep, your grace is... Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Where grace is found, that is where you are. And where you are, Lord. Your word gives me liberty. Your word sets me free. sin runs deep in the midst of all the imperfections that we have that is what I come for your grace your grace your grace your grace where you are and where you are I am free I'm free I'm free speak with you. Allow the Lord to speak with you. Let him minister to your heart. Just the only thing you need to do is not get distracted but keep your eyes on his face. Let his spirit speak to your spirit deep unto deep unto your heart so you will just know there are some things you would just know as you spend time quiet in his presence. people, oh Lord, under your love. Just wrap them under your wings, oh Lord. Wrap them under your wings. Wrap them, wrap them, wrap them before you.
Do you be the glory and the honor of Father? To be the glory and the honor. Can I ask all of you to just rise up as we declare the promises of God? Repeat these words after me in boldness. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. For my righteousness is of the Lord. Whatever I do will prosper. For I am like a tree. That's, that's planted by the rivers of water. The peace of God which passeth all understanding. Keeps my heart and my mind. Through Christ Jesus. And the things which are good. And pure. And perfect. And lovely, I think only on these things. I think only on these things. God is on my side. God is in me now. Who can be against me? He's given unto me all things that pertains to this life and godliness. Therefore, I'm a partaker of his divine nature. Can you just greet someone whom you haven't greeted and sit down? Okay, I want to quickly run through the announcements. Uh, we know that there is uh, a regular prayer at 7.30 in the evenings on, on Tuesday. Uh, and uh, so that's happening this Tuesday as well, as usual. And um, we have a special prayer for the Congolese Independence Day planned on Friday, 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Okay, and then we also have extol, uh, and that is today. You would have seen some difference as you walked into the church this morning. Uh, so they're getting ready for the evening event. So that starts at 5.30 p.m. Uh, can you please make it on time? If you come a little earlier, you can you know, mingle around with all the people and let it be a time of celebration. So that starts at 5.30. Be here before time and let's enjoy and celebrate in the presence of the Lord. Those are the announcements for this week. Uh, shall we get ready to give our best to the Lord? Shall we all stand up? Amen. The Bible says that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Um, yeah, just, just a hint. I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us Lord, I lift Lord, I lift your name on high Lord, I love to sing your praises I'm so glad I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us you came from heaven to earth to show the way From the earth to the cross, my death to pay From the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky Lord, I lift your name on high You came from heaven to earth to show the way From the earth to the cross, my death to pay From the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I 
lift your name on high Lord, I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us Lord, I live So glad you're in my so glad I'm so glad you came to save us You came, you came from heaven to earth To show the way From the earth to the cross My destiny From the cross to the grave From the grave to the sky Lord, I live today for now I live today, I live today Today we live today. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's be seated. Amen. Lord, we lift your name on high. Amen. Every single day of our lives, in every single thing that we do, we lift His name on high. Amen. We bring glory to His name. Hallelujah. Amen. The last six months, we've been going through a series on understanding the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure that many of you can testify to the fact that we have began understanding the Holy Spirit in an entire new light in a new perspective, and the kind of relationship that we have been able to build with God our Father has been very special. Amen? Hallelujah. Those of you who have, been, who have missed the series or missed parts of the series, I would encourage you to go back and listen to it. It's all available on YouTube. Amen? It will change your entire perspective of about who the Holy Spirit is. Amen? We began at the beginning of this year by asking ourselves a question, who really is the Holy Spirit? Now many of us could make statements, we could have made a lot of you know, answers saying that you know, He is the comforter, He is our friend, He is he's a lot of things. And we have all but stated His attributes. But have we have actually taken the time to understand the Holy Spirit for who He really is? And that's what our focus has been across the last six months, building an understanding on the Holy Spirit, and that has come through building a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Amen? We have understood that the Holy Spirit is not just a breeze that blows through our church, not just a fragrance that we get occasionally in our lives, but He is a person. He is God in the Spirit. He is God in action on earth. Hallelujah. And when we have understood who He is, that, then when we make a statement saying that the Holy Spirit is my friend, we can actually relate to that statement. Because many a times in the past we have said, you know what, when, 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 when we were explaining the Holy Spirit to somebody, we would say the Holy Spirit is a friend. And if somebody turned around and said, okay, fine, so tell me something about your friend. Many times we were speechless. But this morning, today, when somebody, if somebody had to ask me that question, the kind of way we have progressed across the year, I'm able to now give a more concrete answer. I'm able to now relate to things in my life. Those moments when we felt all alone. Those moments when our seeming friends around us have left us. Those moments when people who we trusted has abandoned us. And the only one that stood by us, the only one that was with us, the only one that held our hands, the only one that was our comfort during that period was the Holy Spirit. So this morning, if you ask me about who is your friend, I'm able to give you an answer about who my friend is. Because I've experienced that friendship in my life. If today you ask me about the Holy Spirit being my counselor, I can give you an example. I can give you many examples of how He has been a counselor in my life. 
the times when I was at crossroads on decisions I needed to make. And when he was my advisor, when he gave me directions, when he opened my eyes to things that I never knew. And we have moved through a series on the Holy Spirit that has helped us understand the Holy Spirit better. We have understood how the Godhead operates, where God the Father makes the decisions. He decides. God the Son declares, and God the Holy Spirit does. We have realized that everything that we see around us is created through the Holy Spirit. And the way God has been revealing Himself to us has only been with the intention to be able to build a stronger and a closer relationship with Him. Hallelujah. Amen. Now in the last couple of weeks, we've been touching many aspects on the Holy Spirit. And this morning, as we come to a conclusion on the series, I would like to conclude on, 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 on the message that we started last week, which was the desiring of spiritual gifts. Now, as we read the book of Corinthians, we see Paul relating or, or, or writing to the church of Corinth. And he's saying that, you know what? It is good to desire spiritual gifts. There's nothing wrong in it. In fact, I would encourage you to desire the best of them because God wants to give you the best. But he says you don't do this with the intentions of having competition with each other. You don't do this with the intentions of trying to show that you got the better gift than the other person next to you. And he goes on to say in that chapter that, you know what, in all of the spiritual gifts that you desire, let me show you the best. The best in all of them. And he goes on to show you that the best in all of this is love. And he says, there's no point if you have the gift of healing, the gift of discernment, speaking in tongues, and all those wonderful things if you don't have love. Love is the foundation and the key to everything. Because it is out of love is where your compassion is birthed. And when your compassion comes forth according to the situation that you see around you, that's when you're willing to step out there and reach out out of your comfort zone. Reach out out of your busy world and be a help to somebody else in need. A genuine help without the intention or the thought of having something back in return. And we see that for God so loved the world that he gave his very best. The gift of love birthed Jesus into this world. Who out of love for us died for the sins of the world. And Paul goes on to encourage the Corinth church in various aspects. Now we need to understand a little background about the Corinthian church. You see, Corinth was a Roman city. But it wasn't just another Roman city. This city was a Roman city with a lot of Greek influence. Their gatherings that they had were very different from what we have today. The kind of churches we have, the kind of congregations, the way we gather was very different in those days. Most of the Corinthian church at that point of time were made up of people who were slaves. And they were not in a position to come and gather like us on a Sunday morning all together in one place. No. They would come together as they were able to in groups, in families. Probably at somebody's house or maybe at a common place. They would cook, they would bring food together, they would share. It was an atmosphere of love. It was an atmosphere of oneness. Something that we seem to have lost over the years. We come to church, yes. We call ourselves the body of Christ, yes. We shake each other's hands, we smile at each other at the beginning of the service. Probably say a few hellos, good mornings. At the end of the service, we do probably the same thing and we go back into our own personal worlds. Into our own lives. We don't have the time of sharing anymore. I remember the, uh, in the early days when, when this ministry was birthed and the church was still small. We used to have times like this, just like the Corinthian church, where we would gather together, bring our food together. We used to call it potluck. Just come for a time of fellowship. It was a time where we could bond as family. It was a time where we could come 
and get to know each other. Hallelujah. How many of us can say this morning, I know the family next to me who's sitting right now? Interesting, isn't it? We've been coming to church for years. We've probably seen each other's faces for a long time. But how many of us know the family sitting next to us? How many of us have shared a meal with the family sitting next to us? The Corinthian church was very, very different in those days. In fact, the early church, this is exactly how they were. A time of fellowship. A time where they would gather, not only just share a meal, but share everything about their lives. The good times, the bad times. They rejoiced and were happy with the good. They bore the pain of the bad. They encouraged each other. They loved each other. They prayed for each other. And this is how the Spirit of God was preparing the church in those days. And Paul, in his, in his instructions, in his letter, his desire is to give them a little bit of order, a little bit of structure, and be able to give them a little bit of guidance in how to be able to handle the various affairs that they have in their church and how to be able to handle the various ministries that are, that are being birthed through the Spirit in the church, how to handle the various gifts that God is being giving into the church. Now, in those days, prophet, prophetic utter, uh, utterances was very common. When they used to gather and they used to spend time in the presence of God just worshipping, probably a sister on the side would start singing and everybody would join and they would go into you know, various things. They would have communion together on a regular basis. Amen? And, and people would prophesy. And I'm not just talking about one or two. I'm talking about all over the room. Prophetic utterances uh, Utterances was very common in the early church. And Paul, in his letter, he's writing to the, to, the, to the Corinth church and he's giving some instructions in this matter. Amen. If you turn with me to your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 29, this is how he says it. He says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Paul is not discouraging prophetic utterances. He's saying, yes, as many of you want to prophesy, that's great. But he's also giving them instructions saying that, you know what? Just because somebody says, thus saith the Lord, you don't run with it. You don't get carried away with it. He says, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, my church in Corinth. God is blessing you with the gift of prophecy. But I don't want you to just run blind with it. Two or three of you prophesy, that's good. But I want the rest of you who hear what they're saying. Judge the prophecy. Test the prophecy. See if it's really from the Holy Spirit. In fact, he, he re cements this in a further instruction at a different point. But if you read uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 20 to 21, this is what he says. And this was to the Thessalonian church, but very similar as far as instructions in prophecy. He says this, do not treat prophecies with contempt. What he's trying to say is, you know what? You might be 20, 30 years in the Lord. Maybe the person next to you is just about a year, maybe six months. Just come to know the Lord, been water baptized. And the Spirit of God is speaking through them. But just because they're younger than you in the Lord, don't treat it with contempt. However, he goes on to say, test them all. Test all that you hear. Hold on to what is good. Paul is encouraging prophecy, but instead, uh, but instructs them that you know what? Don't run away with just everything that everybody says as thus saith the Lord. Test it. Check it against the word. In those days and even in today, many times untested prophecies have led to errors in the church. They have led to creating cults in the church. They have led to even churches splitting because we chose to just run with it. Just because a person has prophet as a title behind his name. Or probably the gift of prophecy. Maybe one or two of his prophecies were accurate. But just because he said something under the banner of thus saith the Lord. Paul is saying that don't get carried away just because of that. Test the prophecy. Make sure that it is really from God. Hallelujah. Amen. Paul's instructions to the church is this. 
When you have a gathering, whether it's a service, whether it's just a small informal group, and somebody begins to prophesy, always examine the prophecy. Don't go blind behind it. If a church or a congregation runs blind behind a prophecy without testing it, they're going outside the word of God. And the best way to test prophecy is always against the word of God. Always against the word of God. Why? Because God will never contradict himself. He will never contradict himself. God will not say something in the word and say something else out of prophecy. It will always be in alignment with the word of God. And these are the instructions he's giving to the, to the Corinth church because God has began moving powerfully in the Corinth church. The gifts of prophecy are operating ac across the church, across all categories of people, whether slave or free man. Amen? Hallelujah? God is using them powerfully. But at the same time, He doesn't want them to get carried away. Many times when you are in a gathering of people who are prophesying and you are not able to say anything, you can feel insecure. And sometimes, just to fit in, we might try to say something, say, thus saith the Lord, just so that people think that, you know what, we are in the same spirit with them. But we need to be careful when we use God's name behind what we're trying to say. And at the same time, the hearers of what is being said need to be careful about what they receive. And these are the instructions he's giving to the church. He says, always test it. Test it. Because in 2 Corinthians 13 verses 1, he says, By the mouth of two or three witnesses will every word be established. Amen? Hallelujah. If you read your Bible, just see this. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Which means that if God has given you a prophecy, don't just run blind behind it. Wait. Because that prophecy, if it is from the Lord, will be established by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Amen. And I see the very same examples even in my father's life. And he was called into the ministry. It wasn't just based on one person prophesying over his life saying that God is calling you. It was by several at different intervals in different settings. And they never knew each other. Hallelujah. You might feel a calling upon your life. Maybe you went for a meeting and somebody laid their hands upon you and said that God is calling you into the ministry to do this, this, this. Be like Mary. Seal it in your heart. Examine it. Pray about it. Let God confirm it. Because if it is from the Lord, it will come to pass. Hallelujah. It will come to pass. Amen. So Paul, Paul is encouraged his church saying that by the mouth of two or three witnesses will everything be established. Hallelujah. During Paul's time, there are many who came and prophesied to Paul. If you read about Paul's life in the Bible, you'll see many people coming and prophesying to Paul. And many a times those prophecies were true. They were accurate. But Paul was very careful with what he did with them. He never let any of the prophecies stop him on the road that God put him on. However true they were, however accurate they were, but whoever it came from, no matter what the reputation of the prophet was, he never allowed prophecy to stop him from fulfilling what God placed him to fulfill. Let me give you an example on that. Acts 20, verses 10 to verses 13. This is a very good example, amen? If you have your Bibles, please turn with me. Acts 21, verses 10 to verses 13. New King James Version, this is what it says. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Ag Ag Agabus, or Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet. That means the prophet took Paul's belt and tied his own hands and feet. Amen. And he said, thus says the Holy Spirit. So shall the Jews of Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him to the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, 
What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. The prophecy was saying that, you know what? If you go to Jerusalem, this is what's going to happen to you. And if you go on reading further down into the chapters in Acts, you will see that this is exactly what happened to him. But what is his reply here? He says, why are you weeping for me and breaking my heart? Don't you not know that I'm willing to lay my life down for Jesus? If somebody walked up to you and said, my brother, my sister, don't go to Gujarat because they're going to beat you up. They're going to, you know, put you in a hospital because you're going to preach the name of Jesus. What would our reply be? But Paul was a bold man. Amen. He said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God unto salvation, which means that this world has got to hear this gospel for them to have the opportunity for salvation. We are so worried about our personal security sometimes, our own safety, that we are afraid to be able to share Jesus because we are afraid to be persecuted. Well, the early church did not have this luxury, dear church, that we have today. Yes, there is persecution that's happening in the church across India and across the world, but it is nothing compared to what the early church went through. And they never shied away from being a witness for Christ. Never. There were examples when the Christians were tied to posts on the road to Rome, if I'm not mistaken. They were covered in tar, white tar, so that they would burn slowly. They were covered in tar, and they were burnt. And many said that as they walked down that road, they would hear angelic voices singing glory to God. In that persecution, in that pain, they sang glory. They were thrown in the arena before lions. Their families included, their children with them. And they would see the lions pulling them out one by one. And they were asked, just deny your Jesus. Just deny your Jesus. But they did not. Hallelujah. The time is coming. It's almost a full circle. Where we will be tested for our faith. The question is how many of us will stand on that day? Will we deny our Jesus? Only time will tell. Hallelujah. Amen. Prophetic utterances. Amen. They are given for the edification, for the correction, for the comfort of the body of Christ. They were never given as a command. You have to do this. They were never given to force your action, to force your will. Because the God that you serve is a God that respects your will. He will never force you against your will. Hallelujah. Amen. He tests you from time to time. That's true. But he always respects your decisions. Hallelujah. Amen. Many times we say that, you know what? God made me do this. God forced me to do this. That's not true. Because if God is a God that says he's given you a free will to make a choice and a decision for yourself, then that God is not being, going to be a God that forces you to do something that you don't want to do. If he's a God that forces you to do something you don't want to do, then there's something wrong with the statement that God has given you a will of your own. Hallelujah. Amen. God has given you the right to make choices, the right to make decisions. And you see this in the life of Paul. Although there were many prophecies warning him about many dangers and perils ahead of him in his ministry, Paul never allowed that to affect his commitment to God. Never allowed it to deviate him from the road that God placed him on. If God has placed you on a certain path, if God has given you certain instructions and directions about your life, He is your guide. 
Let me repeat that again. He is your guide. He is not your drill master. He will never command you and force you saying, you know, you have to do this. No, that's not how God operates. From the beginning of time when he created Adam and Eve. And he gave them instructions about the garden. And he told them about what to do and what not to do. He never came in, mid, in the between when he was having a discussion with the servant and making a decision about eating the fruit. He never came and stopped them and said, no, listen, I told you, don't do that. He gave them the choice. And that God has not changed from the beginning of time till today. Each one of us has a choice of our own. Decisions that we make. So when we make choices in our life, when we choose to make certain decisions that are not, you know, honoring God, please let's not call, you know, blame God when things don't go our way. Many times we do that. When things don't happen in our favor, when things go wrong, we immediately say, God, it's your fault. We need to think. God guides us, yes. He gives us instructions in His Word in what to do and what not to do. He shows us the way of life. But if we choose to make decisions based on our own judgment, on what we think is right, and if it doesn't work out, don't blame God, but rather turn to Him and ask Him to help. Hallelujah. Because He will never leave you. He's by your side, and He knows how to turn everything around that went wrong back into order into your life. However hopeless the situation is, no matter what you have faced, no matter what loss you have gone through, He knows how to reverse things. That's the God you serve. A God that is beyond. A God beyond comprehension. Hallelujah. Amen. So as we move on and as we look, I look at this further, amen. Hallelujah. This is what He's saying. That if you have a desire to do His will, if this is your heart's desire, my God, I want to do your will, not my will. Yes, I know you're giving me a free will. You're allowing me to make choices. But my God, my desire, my strongest desire is to see you glorified. I want to do your will. He will guide you. He will guide you. That's the reason why in, in Psalms 37, 23 and 24. Amen. Let's turn to our Bible. Psalms 37, verses 23 and 24. And I want you to underline this in your Bible. Because this is going to be an encouragement to you during times of when you fall. This is what it says. The steps of a good man. It's talking about you and me. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his ways. Though he falls. Though he might make mistakes. Though things might get all messed up in his life. Though he falls. He will not utterly be cast down. He will not be destroyed. He will not be trampled into the ground. Why? Because the Lord. The Lord his God. The Lord his God, the Lord upholds him with his hands. God has got your back, dear church. God has got your back. He goes before you. He knows there are times that you will trip, you will fall. But that does not mean that you are out of the race. It does not mean that is the end. He says that even though you fall, no matter how great that fall might be, he got you. He got you. He will uphold you in His hands. Hallelujah. He will uphold you in His hands. Because God is a God that loves. He's a God that is with you. He stands by you. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's not mix up self-will with freedom. Hallelujah. Amen. Self-will and freedom are completely different things. How does God allow you to step and make decisions and yet guides you is not a mystery. It is just loving assurance that God is with you. That no matter what happens when you turn to Him. Remember in the beginning I said, when we say the Holy Spirit is our friend, what do you mean? And then you think back in your life, the times when you felt all alone. When everybody left you. When things were absolutely a mess, when your world was upside down, there was a time you were doing well and you had a lot of friends. People loved you, people cared about you, people would call you on a daily basis. 
People would say, you know what, I'm going here, I'm going there, would you like to join me? But then there's a time in your life when everything is dark. When nobody even remembers your phone number anymore. When nobody wants to even get to know what you're going through. Because they don't want to get involved in that time. You got a friend. You got a friend that will never leave you. You got a friend that got your back. You got a friend that is by your side. You got a friend whose arms are around you. That's who the Holy Spirit is. Amen. Hallelujah. He guides us with loving assurance, telling us that He is with us. He is our guide. He is our rock. He is our fortress. He is our high tower. He is our deliverer. Amen. Psalms 91. This is something that we started last Sunday in the second service. This is a very dear psalm to my heart. Because it's not just a psalm, but it means so much more to me. Because I've learned to run into my secret place. I've learned to go into the shadow of the Almighty. Hallelujah. With loving assurance, He guides us. Amen. When we walk, we walk in the Spirit. We walk by the Spirit. If you desire to do the will of God, you need to be willing to step out in faith. For a ship to be steered to its destination, the ship needs to start moving. It cannot be anchored at the port and expected to reach Spain. Hallelujah. The ship needs to start a journey. If you need to, to do the will of God, if your desire is to do the will of God, you cannot allow yourself to be anchored at port. You need to be willing to cast off those anchors and move in faith. And then God begins guiding you. He begins directing you in the direction that He wants to take you. Hallelujah. Amen. That's the reason why John 8 verses 36 says, You know, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Because He not only gives you freedom, but He also guides you to be able to complete what you need to achieve in life. Hallelujah. Amen. Because this is how your Christian life is. Hallelujah. Belonging to God, but still being yourself. Belonging to God, but still being yourself. Just because you're giving your heart to God, just because you are His, does not mean He strips you of yourself. Because you find your real identity in Him. Amen. Remember, before you were created, He created. He created the purpose. Based on the purpose He created you. So when you learn to find Him, and He becomes your identity, you find your purpose in Him. Hallelujah. Amen. So often, and this is very true in church, and I'm sure many of you have heard this firsthand. So often, people misuse prophetic utterances. Amen. For example, it could be a man, it could be a woman. They walk up to somebody in the church. Say a man walks up to a woman and says, you are created so wonderfully in the image of God. And the sister, it catches the sister's attention. She turns out, really? I see the light of God shining in you. Makes her even more excited. Really? And I thank God for creating you. Why? Because he created you for me. You know, I felt the spirit of God this morning as I was worshipping. And I looked at you and the radiance on your face. The spirit of God is saying that you are to be my wife. You know, it's so surprising universally that people believe that God has got a husband or a wife in the wings waiting for them. God is not in the business of matchmaking. Let me tell you this this morning. If anybody's been telling you, you know what, God told me to marry you, something is wrong there. God is not in the business of matchmaking. You can pray and ask Him for the right spouse. You can tell Him the qualities that you require and He will bring you in contact with that person. But He's not going to take your hand and His hand, put it together and join you and say, okay, now. You need to learn if you come across the right person in your life, you need to learn how to seize the opportunity. But don't go around saying that, hey, God created you just for me. 
Heaven is not a marriage bureau. And let me tell you something this morning. No marriages are made in heaven. It's all made in earth. Hallelujah. So by coincidence, or even if somebody came and prophesied saying that, you know what, God said this, be very careful. Because it is a life choice you're making. You're going to be spending your life with that person. And if you're choosing wrong, then you need to be able to live with those consequences. God gives guidance in His Word, yes. In fact, one of the guidance that He's given is this. 2 Corinthians verses, uh, chapter 6, verses 14. And this verse is for all unmarried people in this church. Do not, this is what God is saying, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? So don't come up with a dialogue saying, you know what, I'll get married and then I'll save him or I'll save her. You can't change anybody. I'll change them. It's okay, they're having a little drinking habit now, a little smoking habit now, a little anger now, anger management. Once in a while, he takes a swing at me. It's okay. I'll go for martial arts classes before saying I do. If the person does not love God, he or she, does not share your interest and your passion. Which means that God is not the center of their life. So if God is the center of your life and you marry somebody who's God, who does not care two hoots about your God, how do you expect your marriage to work? That's the reason why God gives clear directions in the word of God. Do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. Because what relationship can light have with darkness? It cannot mix. It cannot mix. Light and darkness are always separate. Where light is, there is no darkness. Where darkness is, there is no light. So, so you see, God is giving us instructions. He is giving us direction. He is giving us guidance. But if we choose to make those mistakes, let us not blame God for our marriage. Hallelujah. He is not responsible for our bad marriages. That is something we need to take responsibility for. We need to take responsibility. We need to work upon it. We need to pray about it. And we need to ask God for the wisdom to be able to handle those things. And He's such a loving God that He says that if one is saved, the household shall be saved. So which means that if you are already married to a spouse that is not a believer, don't lose heart. And please don't run to the divorce court after the service. Saying the Bible said that so I have to make corrections. No. The Bible also says that one is saved, the household shall be saved. Which means that get on your knees and start praying for your husband or wife. For them to receive the salvation. So that they're not only with you on this earth, but they also celebrate eternity with you in heaven. They can enjoy the God that you enjoy. The relationship that you have with your father. They can enjoy that too. Be the example of Christ to them because who will know you better than your own spouse they know you exactly how you look when you get up in the morning our moods our grumpinesses if you don't get our coffee on time my wife is already laughing I'm not that grumpy you see but I do like my coffee in the morning Interesting, isn't that? So if you need them to receive Jesus into their heart the way you have, then you need to be that example. You need to be a practical example of Jesus. The love of God that passeth all understanding. Oh, that's interesting. The love of God that passeth all understanding. How? Especially when we are in arguments. We need a lot of understanding. It has to pass a lot. 
not only keep, oh, it keeps our hearts and our minds. Amen. Many times we lose our mind out there. We blow a fuse up here. It is natural. It is very natural. In marriage and in life, it is very natural. When things get heated up, when the pressure cooker starts whistling, that whistle really goes loud. Amen. How wonderful is the word of God? You know, the love of God that passes all understanding. You know, in that situation, you need something like that. It passes really all understanding. Amen. Because you don't know, you really can't understand how you can keep your cool at that point of time. You know, my wife is a witness out here. Hallelujah. Thank you, wife, for being here. She doesn't like me staying quiet, you know, when she's arguing. Say something back. Say something back. I know if I say something back, it will never end. It will really be like that movie, The Never Ending Story. That story will not end. But if I don't say something back, it will never end either. So I always learned the best solution is let the love of God take place and say, even if you are not in the fault, I am sorry, honey. <laughs> I am sorry, honey. <laughs> you see, the love of God that's passing all my understanding. It keeps my heart and my mind. We really need that, you know. Keeping our heart and our mind. Oh boy, a cool head at that point of time goes a long way. Amen. Amen. Coming back to this. Hallelujah. Amen. If somebody gives you a word saying, Thus saith the Lord, this person, that person has been chosen by God for you. Treat it very carefully. Because many a time such marriages are more fleshly than heavenly. Many times. This is what I did in my life and this is what my wife did too. You can talk to her after she'll explain in detail. Don't go into too much detail. You see, when we were looking for each other, that's the best way of putting it. When we were looking for each other, we never knew each other, you know. But what we did is we did make a list of what we were looking for in a partner. And the first thing on my list was this. The person that you give me in my life is, should be a person who loves you with all her heart. She has to be a person who loves you with all her heart. Number one category. First tick mark on my list. She has to be a person who loves you first with all her heart. And then of course I had a lot of other things which I keep personally for myself. <laughs> you know, the colored eyes. My aunt, my aunt is sitting here, she can tell you. You know, the colored eyes, fair, all, all lovely features anyways. Amen. But, but I started with this. I did not go into the physical aspects or description. I went into the heart of the matter. Why? Because it was a matter of the heart. Think about that for a second. You see, the heart of the matter is really a matter of the heart. And so we both listed our own requirements. She made her list. She said, the person I marry should be a pastor's son. Hallelujah. He should be a worship leader. The time we met, I was the worship leader. Amen. And she did put down, now, a combination of the pastor's son and the worship leader. Now, that is really cutting that list quite short. So, you see, we searched quite a bit in our lives. I went through a co-education school. There were many beautiful girls in my class. Many of my friends were going in and out of love like as though they were changing clothes. But I was very clear about what I wanted. So, I did not waste my time playing around in those kind of games. Amen. Hallelujah. And that goes out to all you young men too. Think about that. Be clear about what you want. Only then you'll get what you want. Amen. If you're not, you will just get something and then after that, don't blame God for it. Amen. It's like saying, you know, I want a bike. And God turns around and says, which bike do you want? There's so many. Yamaha, RX100. That's a, that's a Yamaha. Hero Honda. Which bike? So you have to be specific. Same way with your life partner. If you can be specific about the kind of bike you want, be specific about your life partner because that's something you're spending your life with. It's not like, you know, you get tired of your bike today, you change it for a newer model. Oh, many people do that in their life too. That's really happening today, you know. We get tired of our wipey change for a newer model. Well, that's, that's not the way it's 
God's plan was. That was never the way God's plan was. Hallelujah. Amen. So don't blame God for bad marriages. It is not his fault. But it's your responsibility to pray for your spouse to work on your marriage. And don't get carried away because somebody just came and said, Thus saith the Lord. Because God is not in the business of matchmaking. You pray for a partner, he will guide you. He will bring people into your life that match the kind of things that you're looking for. But it's up to you to seize the moment. You to seize your opportunity. Amen. Because if you know the word of God thoroughly, you will see that God is not in a business of imposing his will upon your life. He is in the business of guiding you. He's the business of showing you the way. Your father might have been a doctor. But does he impose upon you that you have to become a doctor too? I know that is the case in some of our traditional Indian homes. But in today's world, wouldn't you give your child the choice of deciding what they want to become in life? You will guide them. You will educate them. You will give them the benefits of what it is to become a doctor. But you'll never force them to become a doctor just because you were. Same way with the Heavenly Father. He will never force you into decisions just because He said so. He will give you guidance. He will tell you, this is the right way, my son. This is the right, right way, my daughter. This is how you go about making choices in your life. But He will never say, you have to do this. He will give you that. He respects your free will. That's how God operates. And remember this. In prophetic utterances, it is meant for the edification. It is meant for correction. It is meant for comfort. It is never meant to impose upon you a decision or an action that you have to take. You get to choose. And this is what Paul was telling to the church in Corinth 2. It's wonderful God working through you, giving you the gift of prophecy. You get the opportunity to say, you know, you experience the Spirit speaking through your life. But number one, every prophecy that comes forth, examine it. Let it be confirmed by two or three witnesses. And when you're absolutely sure that this is from God, hold on to what is good. Now this what is good is not meant for what tickles your ears. If, it's, if, if the prophecy is, you know, wonderful for you, oh, you're going to get a Mercedes Benz, don't feel very happy about it and say, yeah, that, that's the prophecy I'm going to hold on to. And if somebody comes and says, God is telling you that the life that you're living is not right, say, no, no, no I don't want to hear that. What is good means what is truly from God. Because everything that comes from God is for your good. Everything. That comes from God is for your good. Why? Because He loves you. That's the first thing. He loves you. Never forget this. Whatever God does in your life, whatever you face, every test, every trial, every, every, uh, you know, every storm that you go through, God is with you and He wants you to know that He loves you. So everything that God tells you through His word, correction or comfort is meant for your good. That's why examine it against the word of God. And if it is found to be true, Hold on to it. Not just because it makes you feel good. Hold on to what is good. That's what Paul instructs them. Amen. Because the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in you. He delights in the success of his children. He knows how to turn your mourning into dancing. He knows how to take your failures and make it a success. He knows how to take the wrong turns in your life and make it right. He knows how to bring you through the wilderness into your promised land. Even though there may be giants in your land, He knows how to give you success. He, is the, he, he lifts you up in His time. At the right time, when you are ready, you will, be, you will be taken up to become the head and not the tail. And many of us can witness that in our lives. From humble beginnings, from, from people amongst those who had more higher education, more, more influence in their lives. God has lifted us, various of people of us in this church, God has lifted us from that to become the head in many aspects in life. 
I have seen it in my life. My cousins can tell about it in their lives. Many of you all can say it in your own lives. In his time, he makes all things beautiful. Hallelujah. That's the God we serve. Amen. So, every time you fall, don't lose heart. Because irrespective of what you go through, remember, you are still on the road to glory. Because he's got you in his hands. Amen. He has got you in his hands. Even though you fall, you will not be cast out. Because the Lord upholds you. He lifts you. He holds you. He embraces you in his hands. Amen. Let's stand to our feet as we get ready to close this morning. For a time, we will be ending on the series on the Holy Spirit. But all we have learned across these six months, let it change your perspective about who the Holy Spirit is. Let it change your thinking. Let it change your approach to God himself. Because remember, the Father desires to build a relationship with his children. His thoughts are always good towards you. He's always thinking of your tomorrow. He's always looking at how to help you fulfill the purpose behind why you were created. He's got good thoughts. He's got high plans. He's got the best for your life. But you need to learn to trust him and walk in the spirit one day at a time. May these months that you have sat and heard from God about the Holy Spirit transform your life forever. Get to know God. Get to know His Spirit. He is with you always. Never leaving you. Never forsaking you. Let's worship. So beautiful And as you are You are Make me humble There's nothing
The more I know you, the more I want to know you. Lord, I know that the only way I can know you more is for you to have more of me. Oh Lord, help me to open up all of me to you. Help me to receive, to acknowledge your Lordship over all areas of my life. Because in doing that, I get to know you more. I get to see your hand operating in my life in all aspects. Whether it is my family, whether it is my business, whether it's my finances, whether it's my personal life, help me to become that living sacrifice. Complete surrender. Complete surrender. Because the only way I can have more of you is by allowing more of me to be exposed to you. I pray this morning that all that you have taught us on the Holy Spirit across these six months, Lord, will not be just wasted words, but will become part of our life, a living testimony in our life, a living word, part of our being, part of our nature. Help us to put the word into practice in our lives. And as you have taught us this morning, O oh Lord, that every prophetic utterance help us to bring it in examination with your word. Because your desire is good towards us. You delight in the prosperity of your children. You delight, O oh Lord. It gladdens your heart. It makes you rejoice when you see us succeed. Succeed in the purpose for why we were created. Help us, O oh Lord, to walk in your word. Help us to walk obediently in your word. Father, this year is still young. There is much we have to learn from you. But whatever you have showed us thus far, help us to be faithful stewards. Faithful stewards. And may our lives bring delight to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We have a few new people in our church. Amen. We have uh, Pushpa uh, Thomas. We have uh, Shushila. Uh, and uh, we have Joshua J Thomas. Amen. And... Uh, Tahila Thomas. Amen. Hallelujah. We would like to welcome you into our family this morning. Church, let's give them a round of applause. And, and after service, I would encourage you, come and meet them and welcome them. Let them feel blessed. Hallelujah. Anybody celebrating their birthdays this week? Any birthdays? Anybody celebrating birthdays? Any wedding anniversaries? Amen. Don't forget this evening we are, we, are, we are having the Extol concert. It's going to be an amazing, powerful time of praise and worship. Amen. A couple of churches are participating. It's going to be amazing. There are a couple of brochures lying at the back on the glass table. Take a few, invite a few friends. Come in a little early because this place is going to be filled. Amen. So come a little early. You will be blessed. It's going to be amazing. Amen. Let's receive the benediction this morning as we get ready to close. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling 
and to present you faultless before the Father. May His Holy Spirit overshadow you, bringing out the best of you for the glory of God. And in all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. He will guide your path. To Him be glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a clap offering this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Be blessed and I will see you all this evening. Amen.